For more physics related videos, please subscribe. Welcome to Stellar Physics 5F. In this video, I'm going to cover helium fusion, which is also known as the triple alpha process. The triple alpha process is one of the more interesting nuclear fusion reactions, and as we're going to see, the history of its discovery is also quite interesting. I've rated the physics level in this video as intermediate. So let's start off with where helium fusion takes place, and that's inside of what's called a red giant star. So initially, a star in what's called the main sequence phase is fusing hydrogen into helium, meaning it's taking four protons and binding them together into one helium nucleus, also called an alpha particle. Once the core runs out of hydrogen to fuse into helium, the star will start to contract, increasing in density and temperature until it gets hot enough to fuse helium into carbon. So it's a little confusing, this is called a red giant, because while the core contracts until helium fusion sets in, the outer layers actually puff out and cool down, making the star redder, hence the term red giant. So in the core, the net fusion process is that three alpha particles or three helium nuclei are gonna to come together and make one carbon nucleus. Outside of the core, we're gonna have another layer where there is still hydrogen around that hasn't fused, and now that layer is gonna be fusing hydrogen into helium. And outside of that, it's too cold for fusion. So as I said, the history of the discovery of how hydrogen fusion works is rather interesting. So if we go back to say the late 1940s, early 50s or so, it was not understood how you could fuse three helium nuclei into a carbon nucleus. Now this was a problem because carbon obviously exists, it's relatively abundant in the universe, but nobody could figure out how to make it. One possibility was you take two alpha particles, they come together and fuse into a beryllium-8 nucleus. Then, another alpha particle comes along and fuses with the beryllium-8 nucleus and makes carbon-12. Well, that seems fairly easy. The problem is beryllium-8 is not stable. And in fact, there are no stable nuclei of mass-8. So you can't even fiddle around with this by converting a proton into a neutron or vice versa to get some other stable nucleus of mass eight because no matter what you do, all nuclei of mass eight are unstable. And that's because this process is actually endothermic, meaning beryllium eight has a higher mass than the two initial alpha particles. Mass and energy are equivalent, so beryllium eight has more energy than the two alpha particles combined, and nature wants to minimize energy, so beryllium eight is actually not a bound nucleus. It's basically just two alpha particles really close to one another. Okay, so it's unstable, but how unstable is it? Well, the half-life of beryllium-8 is about 10 to the minus 16 seconds, so it's highly unstable. And if and when you do make beryllium-8, it's pretty much immediately going to break up back into two alpha particles. So this reaction is no good. We can't make carbon like this. Another possibility might be you start off with a helium nucleus, and maybe there's still some protons around, and so you capture a proton instead and make lithium-5. Then you continue along capturing some stuff until you eventually make carbon-12 in one way or another. Or maybe instead of making lithium-5, you convert a proton into a neutron and you make helium-5. And then again you keep capturing nuclei until you eventually get to carbon-12. Well, guess what? Not only are there no stable nuclei of mass 8, but there are also no stable nuclei of mass 5. And lithium 5 has a half-life of 10 to the minus 22 seconds, so it's even worse. If it is made, it breaks up even faster than beryllium 8. So the lithium 5 route is definitely no good. How about if we go through helium 5? Helium 5 has a half-life of about 10 to the minus 21 seconds. Okay, so that's a little better than lithium-5, but that's still actually no good. In fact, it's not better than lithium-5, it's much worse. Because in this case, you also have to convert a proton into a neutron. And that means you're involving a weak interaction, meaning the weak nuclear force. Because the weak nuclear force is what's responsible for converting protons into neutrons. And as its name suggests, it's a weak force, meaning the likelihood of it happening is small. It doesn't happen very often. So actually, even though this half-life is a little bit longer than the lithium-5 half-life, 
the probability of this happening is basically zero. So this one basically does not happen. There is absolutely no way you can go through this route. So this was the state of physics back in the late 40s, early 50s. You had this mass gap between helium and carbon that seemed to prevent you from making carbon. So here I'm showing you a plot of the relative abundances of various nuclei versus their mass number. Mass number being the same as atomic number in this case. It's just the number of nucleons in a nucleus. So over here we have hydrogen and helium. And here we have carbon, and as you can see, there's a huge gap here in the abundances of nuclei between helium and carbon. And that's because there are no stable nuclei of mass 8 or 5. So somehow we have to figure out how to jump this gap from helium to carbon. Once you have carbon, then you're off to the races. There's no problem. You can make everything else. Well, Let's just say you can make everything up to iron with no problem. There are some other problems with the stuff after iron, but that's a whole separate issue. Now we have to jump this gap somehow, and it would seem that this first option, which is no good, is actually our best option. Somehow this has to work. And as you can see, in this process, we're taking three alpha particles and making one carbon. So this is called the triple alpha process. But it doesn't work. If you're finding this video interesting so far, please like and subscribe and maybe share it with a few friends. Now this is the problem that a physicist named Fred Hoyle was working on back in the early 50s. Fred Hoyle, if you don't know who he is, is basically the guy who invented how stars work, or at least the theory of how stars work, which is that they are powered in their cores by nuclear fusion, which is making heavier elements, and the energy released is supporting the star against gravity. So Fred Hoyle is stuck trying to figure out how this triple alpha process could possibly work. And along comes another man named Ed Saltpeter. And he writes a very short paper that's about one and a half pages long, where he calculates how much beryllium would be around given this half-life of 10 to the minus 16 seconds. So what he does is he takes this reaction here from 2 helium-4 to 1 beryllium-8 to be in nuclear statistical equilibrium, meaning that the forward rates and the backward rates are the same. So there's just as many helium-4 nuclei converting into beryllium-8 as there are beryllium-8 breaking back up into helium-4. So even though these rates are constantly going one way and the other, there's a fixed amount of beryllium-8. It's a very tiny amount because this half-life is so short, but there is, at any given time, some fixed number of beryllium-8 around. And that beryllium-8 can then capture a helium-4 and make carbon-12. And so he runs this calculation in this paper and concludes that, well, actually, even though this half-life is very short, this tiny amount of beryllium-8 around might actually be enough. So he calculates the energy that would be released via this process, given the conditions of a red giant star, and concludes, yeah, it's not great, but it's not horrible either. It might be doable. And then at the end of the paper, he mentions kind of in passing that maybe there's actually a resonant reaction involved here, and that would give the overall process a boost. So before I go any further, let me just remind you what nuclear resonance is. I covered this in Stellar Physics 5C, so I'll try to just recap fairly quickly here. Over on the left here, I have a plot of the potential energy of two nuclei that are coming together. So this ramp, this green ramp up part, is the electrostatic repulsion because nuclei are all positively charged, so they want to repel each other. And then this deep well here is the potential energy well for the strong nuclear force. So if you can get over this electrostatic repulsion, if you can get over this hill, you can think of this exactly like a ball rolling up a hill, then it will fall down into this well, and it'll stay there. And if you're in this well, that's a bound nucleus. So the width of this well is roughly the width of the nucleus. Now, because this is quantum mechanics, you don't actually need enough energy to get over the well. As long as you get close to the top of this well, there's a probability you'll just pop up inside the well. And this is called quantum tunneling. Because the idea is, well, you didn't get over the hill, so you must have tunneled through it. Another thing we have to take into account here is that because of quantum mechanics, only certain energy levels are allowed inside this well. So this is like if you had a ladder or shelves inside the well, the ball can only sit on certain shelves or certain rungs of this ladder. It can't sit between two shelves. 
So now let's compare two different situations. Let's say we have two nuclei coming together whose combined energy is this orange line. So that's the total energy that the two nuclei have. And it turns out that this energy is close to one of these rungs in this well. This situation here, which I'm calling B, is going to be the bound state. Now I want to compare the bound state to an unbound state. Now I'm going to have two different scenarios here. Let's take scenario one. Scenario one means the two nuclei are far apart because R here is the separation distance between the two nuclei. So in situation one, we have two nuclei, they're far apart versus a bound state where they're stuck together. Now, sometimes it turns out that things line up just right, and the two unbound nuclei and the bound nuclei have what are called the same quantum numbers. This just means that basically everything that characterizes them is the same. So they have the same number of protons, the same number of neutrons, the same energy, or at least nearly the same energy. Turns out it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but just close. The same spin. Spin, if you don't know what it is, really just refers to angular momentum. And then the same parity. Parity is a quantum mechanical concept that basically asks, if you take the function describing these nuclei and reflect them in the mirror, does the function look the same or does it look flipped? I know it's weird to think why would that matter, but it turns out that's actually important in quantum mechanics. So now, if the quantum numbers are all the same, the only difference between the bound and unbound state is that they have different locations. If they're unbound, they're far apart, and if they're bound, they're stuck together. So even though the quantum numbers are all the same, because they have different locations, these are obviously two different configurations. But now, what if the nuclei are close to one another, but not bound yet? So now the unbound state looks like this. They're not quite stuck together, but they're almost touching. In this case, the quantum numbers are still all the same, but now the location is the same, or very close to the same. So everything describing these two different scenarios is the same. So we can't tell the difference between the bound and the unbound state. And when I say we can't tell them apart, I don't mean human beings. I mean, as far as nature is concerned, there is no difference. Nature doesn't know the difference between these two situations. And when that happens, it turns out that you get a very large boost in the interaction cross-section. If you don't know what the interaction cross-section is, you can go back to Stellar Physics 5C. But basically, this is just telling you the probability that the two nuclei are going to fuse. So going back to the triple alpha process, Saltpeter mentions in passing, if this reaction involves a nuclear resonance, then that resonance would give this whole process a boost. Fred Hoyle reads this paper, and a light bulb goes off. He's got a model for how red giants are supposed to work. So in this model, red giant cores have some density and temperature, and they have to emit a certain amount of energy in order to support the star against gravity. So he goes ahead and calculates, based on the temperatures and densities and the energy required in his model, where this resonant energy in the carbon nucleus would have to be. Well, the energy levels of a carbon nucleus were known at the time, and they looked something like this. So Fred Hoyle runs his calculation and finds that, in order for his model to work, he needs a resonant energy level right about here. And there's no energy level there. But undeterred, Fred Hoyle plows ahead and does what every good scientist does when an experiment doesn't agree with his theory. He accuses the experimenters of screwing up. So he goes to see a guy named Willie Fowler, who's an experimental nuclear physicist. And actually, I should mention that this reaction is also a resonant reaction because... The energy of beryllium-8 is basically the same energy as two alpha particles. And Willie Fowler is the guy who found this resonant energy. And based on that result, Saltpeter made his calculation of this rate. So getting back to Fred Hoyle, he goes to see Willie Fowler and has the cojones to tell him, there's an energy level here in the carbon-12 nucleus, and not only have you and everyone in your lab missed it, so has every other nuclear physicist in the world. So you should go back and take a look at the carbon nucleus again and find this level that you all missed. At least this is the way I was told the story. My thesis advisor was actually Willie Fowler's student, and this is the story he told me. So this story is probably more Willie Fowler's version of it. So Fowler didn't really take Hoyle that seriously. 
But it just so happened that he had a student who didn't have a project to work on. And he proposed to Fowler, why don't you let me look for it? And Fowler gave him the green light. And lo and behold, he finds that there actually is an energy level almost dead on where Hoyle had predicted. And this level is famously called the Hoyle level. This solved the entire problem of how you make carbon. And as a result of this discovery, Willie Fowler was given a Nobel Prize. But not Fred Hoyle. Even though not only did he predict it, he came up with the entire process of stars being powered by nuclear fusion in their cores. And there's an entire rabbit hole you can go down of theories and explanations as to why Hoyle was snubbed of the Nobel Prize. This is not to say Willie Fowler didn't deserve the prize. Some might argue that Ward Walling or Ward Whaling may have also deserved it. Whatever the case may be, the triple alpha process was solved, and now we understand how carbon is made, and we're off to the races to make all of the other elements in the periodic table. Although, in stars, you can only make up until iron. And in the next couple videos, I'm going to go over how we make the rest of the elements in the periodic table. Starting with the elements up to iron, or near iron. This is called the iron peak. So if you found this video interesting and would like to see more, be sure to like and subscribe. Hit the notification bell to be notified for future videos. And please feel free to leave a comment. Thanks for watching.